Good to see everyone. I'm glad you all made it, even though it's raining. Um, yeah, thank you, Cheyenne, for the, the review. I think I just wanted to add something really quick. It was really good. Um, just, just to see, um, there's some new faces here. I'm really happy to see you all. But just, I think it's really helpful to see the bigger picture of where Exodus is in the Bible. So we all know in Genesis, you know, God created everything. There was Adam and Eve, and then sin came in to Adam and Eve. So they became fallen. Um, and then after that, Adam and Eve had many children. And then the, the Genesis goes through, goes through all these generations. There was Abraham, and there was Isaac, um, Jacob. And eventually, Jacob had 12 sons. I think most of you have probably are, are familiar with this. Um, and, then, and then at one point, at the end of Genesis, there was a great famine. And that caused Jacob to bring his 12 sons, his whole family, into Egypt. Um, and at that time... Um, because of Joseph, one of um, Jacob's sons, the, the, the Jews, the children of, Is children of Israel, were very favorable in Pharaoh's sight. So they had a lot of land. They had a lot of riches. They were, doing, they were flourishing. Um, but then after some years passed, and then there was a new Pharaoh who did not know Joseph and all the things Joseph did for the Egyptian, all, for all the people. You know, he saved them from famine. So then the children of Israel began to be enslaved. And then we see in, in, the, in the beginning of Exodus that they were serving under Pharaoh and he was a very merciless and harsh taskmaster. You know, he had them making, building bricks, building buildings, but then eventually he started giving them less resources and giving, giving them more work to do. Um, and eventually started even to kill all the, all the firstborn of the, of the Jews because they were multiplying so fast. So we can see that the children of Israel were in a very dark and dire situation. And then so out of this, we see one person, Cheyenne mentioned, Moses. Moses was someone who was, he was, somehow he got put into Pharaoh's house. So he was not enslaved with the rest of his people, but he got the best education. He was trained um, under Pharaoh, but somehow he still had a heart for his people. And I think deep down, he knew that he was not an Egyptian, even though, you know, outwardly he was not enslaved. He had many riches. Um, his condition was quite good, but inwardly he knew that he did not belong there and that he needed, he, he needed to help his own people. But then as Cheyenne mentioned, he tried, to, he tried to do that, but it failed miserably. And then after that, he was even afraid for his own life. And then he had to, he had to flee Egypt. And then after 40 years, God appeared to Moses. You know, 40 years, he was doing nothing. He used to be in Pharaoh's house, probably the equivalent of being in the government, in the White House today, you know doing something for his country. But then because of what he did, he had to escape. And then he was just a shepherd in the backside of the wilderness. You know, who knows what he was doing, taking care of sheep, something very meaningless compared to what he was previously doing. But then one day, God appeared to him in a burning bush. He said, Moses, I chose you. I'm calling you to bring my people out of Egypt um, into the good land. But then Moses, he, even after all this, he was very unconfident. After 40 years, he had no more trust in himself. So he said, Lord, you know, I don't believe that the, cho the children will listen to me. I can do this. So then the first sign that God gave him was this matter of the burning bush in Exodus 3. However, this week, what we're coming to, um, three more signs, things that would prepare him, qualify him to be someone who could lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. Um, and then so this all comes from Exodus Exodus 4, 1 through 9. And there are three very significant signs. And these signs are really helpful to us because, you know, they help us in our, as we can see, they're very subjective and experiential to, to us today in our Christian life. So, yeah, there are a lot of verses here. Um, the first point, the staff becoming a serpent. And we'll see that this staff, um, this serpent is Satan. So what happened in this first sign is, God told Moses, you have a staff, you know, a rod. Um, throw it down, and then it became a serpent. Um, so, you know, what, is, what does this show? Moses, at this time, he was 80. He was very old, and, you know, later he said, in Numbers, there's a verse that shows he was ready to die at this point, at 80 years old. So he probably was very frail. He had something that he relied on. But then God showed him, by throwing it on the ground, that this rod, this staff, was actually Satan. And today, you know, everything that we rely on apart from God can actually be used by Satan to usurp us, to distract us. And, you know, as we'll see, these signs, they might seem really negative. 
So the first one is the staff that became the serpent. The second one is his hand becoming leprous, which was a really terrible disease at that time, showing that we're full of sin. And the last one is water that turned into blood. Um, and then, you know, just going back to the story of Moses, God here is preparing Moses to lead the children out of Egypt, right? And this is a very difficult task. There are over 600,000 children, people that needed to be led, um, led out of Egypt. So just think about it for a moment. If you're trying to inspire someone to do a great thing like that, what would you say? Maybe you would tell them, you know, you graduated from Ohio State, which is a really good school. You had a lot of internships. You had a good GPA. You did research over the summers. All this has prepared you to do something great, to lead the ch my people um, out, of, out of Egypt into the good land. However, this was not what God showed Moses. Rather, God showed Moses something that was very personal to him. You know, the staff, without it, you know, maybe he couldn't walk, maybe he couldn't do things, but this thing that he relied on was actually Satan. And then in the next, in the next sign, um, he put his hand on his chest, and then when he took it out, it was leprous. Um, and for those, yeah, leprosy is a very terrible bacterial disease that was pretty prevalent back then. And then it caused your skin to have boils, to have blisters, to disfigure you. So it was a very, you know, you did not want to get this disease. But what even this shows us is that, you know, as, as fallen sinners, who we are inside is sinful. You know, Moses actually, at, at that moment, you know, he didn't do anything. He wasn't doing anything sinful. God just exposed his hand, who he really was, um, was, was, was something sin, sinful. Um, so we can see that God is leading us through, like, through this, the story of Moses and the signs to realize that who we are in ourselves, even though we may have had a lot of good training, a lot of good experiences, outward, outwardly, the world, you know, your friends, your classmates may say, wow, you know, he has a lot going for him. You know, he might do something, do something in this world, make a name for himself. But to God, none of those things matter. To be someone called by God, to work for God, these are actually the things we need to see. That we need to see that what we rely on naturally is Satan and can be used by Satan. We need to see that who we are in ourselves is just sin. We are just rotten, corrupted, and sinful. And we also need to see that the world, the system, not the people, but the system that we are in today um, has been to is totally something designed by Satan to distract us from God, um, just to fill our time, our energy, our money, so that our, our eyes, our heart is attracted to something other than the Lord. Um, so going back, you know, going back to these three, these, these three, these three signs, um, what actually, so, okay, so back to the story, right? Moses throws down his staff, something that he relied on, and it became a serpent. Um, and then what God told him, it's very interesting. He didn't say, throw your staff away. You don't need it anymore, you know? I will, I will supply you now. Rather, he said, pick up the serpent by the tail. And this is very significant that in, you know, today, you all, especially students, you guys are involved in a lot of things at school, trying to get a good education, you know, to study hard, to get a job, or to advance in your, in your career, right? Do something that you want so you can build up a life for yourself. Um, and, but we have to be very clear that God is, of course, not telling us to throw those things away, you know, to drop out of school. But we have to have, but we need to have a change of kind of perspective about about the things we're doing. You know, when Moses picked up the, it was a serpent, right? So it's a snake and he picked it up by the tail. And when he did that, that's, that serpent, that snake had no more power to bite him or harm him. And then he, it was exposed that this thing is actually Satan. And in our lives there, okay, recently I, I heard the story of, you know, a brother in, in, in a church. Um, I didn't know him personally, but this story really struck me that he was very successful in what he was doing, in the job that he was doing, but he felt at some point he got promoted and it felt like it was taking up way too much of his time. Um, so then he started applying for jobs and he was very qualified. But the reason it 
that it was hard for him to find a new job was because he had one criteria, one caveat in all his applications. He said, I will work every moment of the 40 hours while I'm in the office, but outside of that, I am not gonna do anything. I'm not gonna think about work because there's something very important I have to do, which is to be in church meetings, you know, to read the Bible, to take care of his church family. So that was his number one priority. And you know, it was hard for him to find a job, but eventually he did, except that it paid half as much as his old job. But he was still very happy because it, you know, it met his one requirement. So he, he took that job. And later on, you know, a few years later, the company actually started doing really good. And all the money that he had given up by taking this job, he made back. And even his boss told him, you know, when you joined my company, it started to do a lot better. So now, whatever you, whatever you do, um, whatever you have to do outside of work, take care of that because it seems to be really helping our business, <laughs> helping our company. So we can see this is an example. You know, of course, we don't hope to replicate this. You know, don't tell your, your, your teachers you know, this kind of thing. But the, the point is that his heart was that first his time would be for the Lord. That's right. So that's where his priorities were. And that's how he chose to live his life. You know, we might feel that we are very um, controlled. In a sense, we have no choice. You know, we're in school. We're getting a job. We're going on this path. But actually, you know, we have a lot of choices in, all the, in, in the life and the life decisions that we make. And this brother, he for sure didn't predict that you know, this company would take off after he joined, but that, those were the priorities. That was the decision he made, and then the Lord really blessed it. So I think this is just um, an example. You know, this won't be every one of us, our stories, but this is an example of a brother who picked up his job, something that can occupy us, right? Something that we rely on because we, we need money to survive but he picked up the job by the tail. It was, he, in a proper way, he, he still did his work as a good employee, but that was not the number one priority in his heart. Um, so this is the first sign, seeing that anything, our job, our family, our finances, our bank account can be something that, um, something that Satan uses us to distract us, to draw us away from God. Okay, the second sign, is the hand becoming leprous, and, and this signifies sin. And yeah, as I'm going through this, all the, all the verse references are here. So this is from Exodus 4, 6 through 7. And I'll just read it, the underlined part. You know, he put his hand on his bosom, and then he took it out. And there it was, leprous, um, leprous as white as snow. And in, in the Bible, um, we don't have too much time, but there are three examples, three times in the Bible when someone got leprosy, and they were all related to rebellion, to disobeying authority. One was even Moses' sister. Um, she disobeyed Moses, and then as a result, she became leprous. So this is a sign showing that leprosy is a sign of rebellion. And I thought this, and you might think this too, you know, I'm not that rebellious. I don't, I don't break the law. I listen mostly to what my, my elders or the authorities, the people above me, tell me to do. You know, I do all those things. I'm not really rebellious, but actually, you know, the first sin in the Bible was by Lucifer, the angel, um, the topmost angel of God, and his sin was that he rebelled against God, that he, this, he disobeyed God because he thought, you know, he could become better than God, and so actually within us, really, this, it's not even in what we do, you know, you don't have to commit a crime to be sinful to have sin, but that's, that's who we were born. You know, we were born from our parents and no one has to be taught to lie, to steal, to murmur in their hearts, you know, to talk back to your parents. That's just who we are as human beings. And, and this was the second revelation that Moses had to receive is that in himself, like Shan mentioned, we're a thorny bush. You know, we do things that we don't want to do. And that's because here in Romans 7, 17, it makes it very clear that Paul is saying sin is dwelling in us. So it's, it's even personified, right? You know, this is pretty strong. It's not that some, once in a while I might do something bad, but actually there is a nature in us, something that causes us to sin. And this is a, a deep-rooted problem that we in ourselves cannot solve. But then again, what cured um, Moses in this case was, again, listening to God's word. Just, in the just as in the first example, in the second one, Jehovah said, put, 
it says, yeah, put your hand on your bosom again, and then it was restored. Um, so we see again that how are Moses is, you know, through these signs, God is showing him how are these problems solved? It's by listening and keeping God's word. Moses obeyed God, and then, and then his hand became um, clean, uh, uh, clean again. There was no problem. Um, and then lastly, the third sign is the water becoming blood. Um, so I was reading, actually reading a little bit. It was pretty interesting. There's the Nile River at that time, right? They're, they're in Egypt. And the Nile River is actually the longest river in the world, mostly considered. And the Nile River supply is the lifeline for a lot of the civilizations, even now at that time. You know, if you look at a map, it's all desert, but then near the river, there's, there's green on both sides. It allows um, crops to grow. It, it allows, you know, humans to survive. So what this shows is that the Nile River supplied the people of Egypt. It was, without it, they could not survive. However, what happens in this third sign is that Jehovah told Moses, pour this water on the dry ground. And then what happens? It says here, the river will become blood upon the dry ground. And you know, blood is very essential to us. If it's in us, we're good, we're alive. But if blood is spilled, then that is not so good. And you know, what, what this shows here, actually, in Genesis 1-2, the first thing that happened um, after creation, when God was restoring creation, was that the dry ground was brought out of the death waters. And then out from the ground, plants could grow, animals could grow. You know, so life is generated from the ground. So what this shows is that when, when water um, here is, contacts the ground, which is life, which is Christ, then it's revealed, then its true nature is revealed. So as I mentioned earlier, you know, now we live in a world system. And there are a few verses in 1 John that show that Satan actually has um, come up with this system. And last year we had a Bible study on this, if you guys remember, um, about the world system. And, you know, and because man was fallen, Jehovah couldn't be man's protection, entertainment, and provision anymore. So man had to come up with society, cities, music, you know, livelihood, raising animals to sustain themselves. But all these things eventually take over man. You know, there's thousands, you know, all the people in the world today, most of them, the, the, the non, non-believers, even many believers, what are they living for? Not for, not for Christ, but for themselves to, to make something for themselves. You know, they're, they have totally deviated from God's original purpose in creating man. Um, but what, what is so significant here? You know, the water in itself, to us, it may seem like it's, it's the best thing in the world, that it keeps us alive, but it's not until it contacts life that it's the true nature is revealed. And I think I had many experiences of this in college. Um, I went to school here at Ohio State, and at some point I was quite ambitious in advancing my career, um, and I had some successes, some failures, but that was, that was my goal. So that was always what I wanted to do, to get a, to get a better job, to get a job at a certain company. Um, but at the, uh, th- I was very fortunate throughout college. There were some older brothers that I met with regular, regularly and had fellowship. And I felt like every time I talked to them, even though they wouldn't point, you know, point out, hey, you're spending too much time playing Ultimate Frisbee, you're spending too much time you know, working on your homework, maybe you should come to the meeting instead. But they just shared, I think, something that was genuinely touched them that week. And I always felt this experience of the water turning into blood. I just realized, you know, this thing that I really want, you know, even though I don't have it right now, I can see that it won't satisfy me. I think I kind of had that feeling. I was going down this path, but I did not really want to. So, you know, the world, the water may seem really attractive to us, but it's, but in my experience, until we touch the Lord through the, you know, there are many ways, through reading the Bible, through coming to, you know, events, Bible studies, fellowship like this, or having one-on-one fellowship with one another, we can, you know, just the true nature of these things can really be exposed. And I think just, I'll just conclude quickly, just, I think one word was really, kept coming to me as, you know, I was um, reading through this portions is the word exposing. That, you know, Exodus is to get out, right? The, the children, of, children of Israel needed to get out of Egypt, out of their enslaved situation. But first, these things had to be exposed to them and exposed to Moses. Moses had to realize that he was a thorny bush. He was someone that just pricked others. Even though he tried to do good things, it resulted in utter failure. 
He had to realize that what he relied on was Satan. He had to see that in himself, just in his being, who he was. It was not for God, but it was sin. And then finally, he had to see that where he was, where the children of Israel were, they were enslaved in the world under you know, something that outwardly looked really good. But, but when the Lord revealed it, we see that it's just, it's just, it's just death. Um, so I think this, this might seem very negative and might seem like a black picture. But actually, as we go on through, throughout the weeks, throughout Exodus, we'll see that this, all, the, all this, we're kind of setting up a, a really dark background. And we'll see that God was able to use Moses after seeing these signs, you know, to get out of Egypt and eventually to enter into the good land, um, and which is the type of our enjoying Christ, enjoying the Lord today. And just one final word is that in John 14, 21, here it says, he who has my commandments and keeps them, he is the one that loves, who loves me and who loves, and he who loves me will be loved by my father. And again, how did Moses, when he had, when the staff became a serpent, when his hand became leprous, you know, how did he, how did he overcome that is through the word. So as Christians, we just need to be, we just need to be in the word. Even all the things I'm sharing today, right? I would, I would not know these things. It's not like I was, or anyone is just born knowing these things or is somehow better than others. We all start the same, but through reading the word and having fellowship with one another, Satan is, you know, Satan's strategies are exposed and God is also able to speak to each one of us individually. So I'm so thankful that we can, we can see, and I hope we all see a little bit more, that on one hand, it's, it's quite bleak who we are on ourselves, that we cannot really improve, our, we improve ourselves. We cannot not rely. We cannot you know, avoid relying on the world. We cannot avoid being who we are, because that's who we are. But once we see the Lord, and we see that the Lord is this fire burning in us, then we have the strength, we have the faith to take the next step and eventually be led all the way from Egypt out of the world into the good land. Um, yeah, and I think there's been a lot. And then if you have any questions or any fellowship, we'll break into small groups now. So I hope we can keep getting into this together. <laughs>